Okay, um, I think we can start. Oh, although I'm, I'm, I hope I hope we're live. Um, so welcome everyone. My name is Anthony Manchester, and I'm the chair of the uh, IRSG Global Regulatory Coherence Committee. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome you to this online webinar and uh, the launch of our new report, um, which we've uh, which we've been partnering with Evelyn Sutherland on on anti money laundering and beneficial ownership. So firstly, just a few points of housekeeping. Um, I'd like to remind you all um, to please be aware that today's event is being recorded and it may be shared on our digital platforms in the coming days. And if you have any questions, please post them in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screens and we'll endeavor to answer those later on in the session. But without any further ado, I'm delighted to welcome you here this morning um, at our virtual launch. Um, as I say, we partnered with Evelyn Sutherland on this because we believe that in the face of rising levels of money laundering, both due to geopolitical risks and changing nature of illicit finance, the time to ensure that a robust and effective anti-money laundering regime globally is now. We also believe that a transparent beneficial ownership regime is at the core of such a framework. To achieve this, we think there should be coordinated effort on both the domestic and international fronts. And we're supportive of this as we recognize how international cooperation is driving progress across borders to try and tackle some of these problems. Today, at this point in time, we've got an opportunity to bring key global decision makers together to address the challenges and we offer some recommendations on how these can be best achieved. The question is, what legislative and regulatory considerations should there be to enable a transparent and effective framework for beneficial ownership? And we think that trying to answer some of those is the first step in that process. And with this report, we seek to answer precisely this question. To do so, the report sets out seven recommendations. These include the need for clear rules and guidelines around access to beneficial ownership registers, as well as clarity on how to balance privacy rights against the needs of those who need jobless to tackle beneficial uh, anti-money laundering. And we'll be hearing from some, one of those people later on this morning. The recommendations also include the need for beneficial ownership standards that are proportional to the risk of different financial services products and the need for guidelines to professional service providers specifically, as they often certify certain aspects of a company's structure and identity. And last but not least, the report includes recommendations on formatting an internationally consistent UBO, ultimate beneficial owner, and that this threshold and further down the line, the implementation of an international benef benef beneficial ownership register. Throughout the conception of this report, the International Regulatory Strategy Group has engaged with a number of industry stakeholders, and we are grateful for their helpful contributions to this report. And of course, we are exceptionally grateful to Evershed Sutherfield, Sutherland for their collaboration with us. Now I'm going to pass over to Steve Smith, who's the partner for Financial Services Disputes and Investigations at Evershed Sutherland, who has kindly agreed to present the report to you. Steve, over to you. Thanks, Anthony. Um, hello, everyone. Um, as I was last night just finalising uh, my presentation today, I went back to the outset of our collaboration with the IRSG, where actually we were considering a number of different topics, where it was felt an analysis and a deep dive may be of value to looking at how globally we can improve and enhance the approach to the fight against financial crime. But the topic that kept coming back to the forefront of my mind as being the most fundamental in the AML toolkit was the very basic and simple issue around achieving transparency of ownership of assets and legal entities through effective corporate registers. But why is a financial crime lawyer talking about corporate registers when this is surely an issue for corporate lawyers? I hear you say, well, this is not because I have any particular specialist insight into the mechanics of the registers, but I've seen firsthand uh, when defending uh, serious and organised money launderers, prosecuting money launderers, and also working in financial crime compliance with various financial institutions, the value of having good and robust corporate registers so that we can help know our clients. Beneficial ownership information is critical, not just in the investigation and prosecution of financial crimes, but also in financial crime prevention. And it's well known 
that the basic intention of money laundering is to hide the true source of funds to make criminal post proceeds appear to be from legitimate sources. And a well-known technique to support this is to hide the true source and ownership of funds through multiple layers of companies, which are then used to make buffers to make it harder to identify who is ultimately in control of assets owned by those companies. This enables individuals to continue to exercise control over their ill-gotten gains whilst not revealing who they are. So if you can really easily identify who owns and controls a legal entity, it makes it easier to understand the real source of wealth used to fund it. This in turn makes it harder for money launderers to hide the proceeds of crime. And having an effective approach to achieving transparency of beneficial ownership globally is largely accepted, will be a key tool in the fight against financial crime. And by this, what I mean is that public registers that openly share relevant information about ownership that are well managed and effective in providing accurate and reliable information to those people using them. However, how to achieve the most effective approach remains very much a topic of international debate, challenge and difference. Whilst most countries require beneficial ownership to be required in some form or other, many do not actually publish beneficial ownership information of companies set up within their own jurisdictions on public registers. Where this information is published, it can be incomplete, incorrect, or only partially accessible. And we have seen the impact of jurisdictional and forum shopping by those seeking to hide assets through numerous scandals that have emerged, including Panama Papers, Paradise Papers, Pandora Papers, and just last month, the Cyprus leaks. So evidence enough that criminals seek out regimes with less robust requirements around transparency of ownership to hide their ill-gotten assets. This applies equally to corrupt politicians seeking to hide embezzled funds, international drug dealers moving funds around the world at pace, and those seeking to evade taxes or evade sanctions. So we felt that there would be real value in considering the global approach to beneficial ownership by comparing and contrasting the different regimes and seeking to assess what works well and what does not work so well. Hopefully, the comparison set out in our report will help achieve a more transparent and consistent approach globally and ultimately help the prevention, detection and prosecution of money laundering. Uh, we've made recommendations on three different levels. Recommendations to global standard setters such as FATF, the OECD, IOSCO, G7, G20. At national jurisdiction level for all countries and governments to consider. And some, in fact, one that is specific to the UK. And our review comprised three different parts. Firstly, we gathered data to perform a basic compare and contrast of the legal principles underpinning the beneficial ownership regimes globally. With thanks to many colleagues from around the world, we've gathered data about the approach to beneficial ownership registration schemes in 14 different countries, including European member states, the Channel Islands, the US, China, Hong Kong, Singapore, Switzerland, the UAE, India, and the Cayman Islands. And actually, it's been a really interesting exercise, which has brought to life the challenges faced by many different approaches being deployed, seeking to achieve a similar goal, but using slightly different ways to do so. We did find high levels uh, of high level areas of consistency across the regimes, but also found an overall inconsistency of approach. This creates confusion, in our view, about the extent and reliability of information that is available in public registers. In particular, this is relevant to regulated firms tasked with knowing their customers and authorities who are investigating financial crime. The case for having an international standard for beneficial ownership transparency is very strong, and this includes having a consistent threshold at which beneficial ownership is determined. We found that many jurisdictions apply the 25% threshold, which is in line with FATF recommendations. However, this is not universally adopted. This can, we found, create confusion and difficulty in determining the reliability of data provided and obtained from different jurisdictions and their own unique beneficial ownership registration regimes. Some regimes are less scientific than the approach, and indeed some regimes, such as is being considered in the EU, are looking to deploy a lower threshold of 15%. However, what we have found is that a globally consistent threshold would help simplify things and would help an understanding of those using registers about what the standards are and the quality of the information they are receiving. Interestingly, though, 
we found that the percentage threshold figure is not actually the key element. There is no magic number which will eradicate abuse, and criminals will always be able to manipulate any threshold to some degree of success. But a universal threshold of 25% makes the most sense, given that it provides scope for firms to carry out additional due diligence on ownership following a risk-based approach. So where high-risk situations, firms may go to a lower level of, say, 10%, but in less uh, risky situations, stick around the 25%. But having said that, we did find that greater importance should be placed on ensuring consistency globally on the veracity of the registration regimes themselves, the type and extent of data collected. This will simplify the understanding of what you are getting from a register, which will not only reduce the administrative burden on regulated firms, but also on those legitimate cost corporate customers having to provide information to the register. Let's not forget that the benefits of a universally consistent regime are not simply achieving a more effective fight against financial crime or making life easier for the banks. These include benefits to legitimate consumers who will be able to enjoy more efficient and fluent access to banking services as a result of a more consistent and robust KYC information being available. It's about having a fair and proportionate regime that ultimately benefits legitimate users as well as those people providing information to it. But global consistency is a key plank in achieving this. And we also found that actually now is a real interesting time because many jurisdictions are in the middle of live political debate on their national approach to beneficial ownership. So it's a really good time for this report to be uh, making the recommendations around the more consistent approach. Having looked at the compare and contrast of the different regimes, we then went on to look at the current guidance provided by a range of global organizations, including IOSCO, Wolfsburg, the IADB, FATF, and BOLG, the Beneficial Ownership Leadership Group. And we found that there were consistent themes across their guidance. Firstly, identification and verification of beneficial owners is critical in their view. They say that firms working in the regulated sector should keep up to date with changes in beneficial ownership for their clients throughout a relationship. It's not just about at the outset, but it's about being aware as they go through the relationship of changes to beneficial ownership. It's important to be able to easily identify discrepancies or inconsistencies in ownership information, which includes, I think, a push and pull approach of updated information being readily available from the registers, but also discrepancies being reported by regulated firms using that data. Third point, which was a consistent theme, is that beneficial ownership is not just a domestic issue. Jurisdictions must also consider foreign ownership, and for that, international cooperation is key. Fourthly, government support is critical. This includes adequately resourcing the maintenance of national company registers and providing effective enforcement regimes and access to a central register concerning accurate and up-to-date information on beneficial ownership is essential. So these three key themes do seem quite obvious when written down and, and going through them, but it was seen that consistency is yet to be found on how best to achieve them. And we found this is for a number of reasons, including different cultures, the different legal regimes and different economic conditions across the different jurisdictions. So thirdly, we thought it'd be helpful to pull together some case studies to help bring to life the issues that we've seen around globalization of registers and the need for consistency. So we looked at three areas. We looked at data privacy and the interface between data privacy and transparency of beneficial ownership, with the recent tensions in finding the balance between general public interest for open access to beneficial ownership in trade, uh, information, whilst also ensuring that safeguards are in place to protect personal data. And there are real challenges in achieving this, but it is possible to find a balance. Secondly, we looked at the UK specifically and at Companies House as a case study to try and assess the effectiveness of the UK register, as well as the challenges it faces in being abused by money launderers, to bring to life challenges on a global level. We looked at recent changes that have been implemented in the UK to reform requirements for information that is provided to Companies House 
and use these as a benchmark to check and challenge our recommendations. And then lastly, certainly not leastly, we've looked at sanctions. And whilst our report has been focused on AML, we found that sanctions is such a hot topic at the moment that we must consider how beneficial ownership relates to that and is fundamental to an effective sanctions regime. The value of good, reliable, beneficial ownership information is not just found in respect of AML, it has much wider benefits too. So we'll look at this in practice through a sanctions case study. Now I'm conscious of time and I have 15 minutes of which there are very few left. So I'll leave you to, I'll leave you to read the case studies in the report rather than go through them in detail now. But instead, I'll look at the seven recommendations we have made. We firmly believe, firstly, that a consistent global approach will help ensure that international regulatory weaknesses and the ability for jurisdictional arbitrage are addressed. A global approach will reduce the ability of criminals to forum shop where they register their legal entities. This will also help better equip investigators, authorities and firms with AML obligations to quickly and more effectively carry out their tasks. But secondly, in an ideal world, there would be one global approach achieved either through one global register or by standardized registers that are deployed at national level, achieving the same thing in the same way. However, we recognize that this is not going to be achieved anytime soon. So instead, our recommendations are aimed at more practical steps, which could be taken to enable global international harmonization. So our recommendations are that broken down across the three areas, recommendations for global standard setters, recommendations at national jurisdictional level and for the UK government. So for global standard setters, we make five recommendations. One, provide clear rules and guidelines around how access can be given to an overseas register of beneficial ownership and in which circumstances such access can be given, which will make information more readily available across borders. The target outcome of that being to help provide a level playing field of access to overseas countries around beneficial ownership information. Secondly, providing clear rules and guidelines on how to balance privacy rights and the obligations of AML beneficial ownership purposes. Target outcome being to achieve an appropriate balance between those two competing issues to keep both of them complied with. The third is to implement an international register or local, national or regional registers with equivalent requirements, which will help improve transparency globally and help reduce operational burden, promote competitiveness, as well as supporting a more effective financial uh, uh, fight against financial crime. That, in our view, is the holy grail. Um, fourthly, we recommend that the FATF lead on implementing an internationally consistent UBO threshold. Achieving one internationally accepted threshold will help reduce operational burden, promote competitiveness and support a more effective fight against financial crime. And fifthly, consider how to enable more proportionate standards for lower risk financial products. So what opportunity is there for institutions to apply a risk-based approach to beneficial ownership standards, which will enable operational efficiency and allocation resources to higher areas of risk. Now, for national jurisdictions, we have one recommendation, which is to provide guidelines on the requirements for professional service providers who often certify certain aspects of a company's structure and ownership. This should improve clarity on requirements and lead to a more effective beneficial ownership information in the wider ecosystem. And lastly, for the UK, please include a UBO question in the UK beneficial ownership register when understanding who the shareholders directors are of a company when a legal entity is already recorded as a beneficial owner and is subject to its own disclosure requirements. So it doesn't currently have to provide that to the UK. This will achieve improved transparency on ownership information and reduce operational burdens in our view. So just really in summary then, the recommendations will in our view provide four things. A need for clear rules and guidance around access to beneficial ownership information will help balance privacy rights against AML and other purposes the information is critical for. Standards should be proportionate to the risks of different financial services and products. 
and guidelines are needed for professional services firms clearly setting out standards they are expected to adhere to when certifying aspects of beneficial ownership. That is critical. And having a globally consistent threshold for beneficial ownership will also really help achieve consistency. And with that, I'll hand back to Anthony. Steve, thank you so much for that presentation and and and, uh, and going through the issue so so thoroughly and succinctly at the same time. So um, it's my pleasure now to welcome everyone to our online panel discussion. Um, and uh, just a reminder that we will be recording this and it may well be put on our digital channels. Um, I'm going to start, though, by um, introducing the panelists. So firstly, um, Nicholas Ryder, if you could put your camera on, Nick, please. Um, Nick is Professor in Financial Crime at the School of Law and Politics at Cardiff, Uni Cardiff University, and he's an expert in policy-oriented research in financial crime and has played in advisory roles both nationally and internationally. Uh, and Nick is also co-editor-in-chief of the Journal of Economic Criminology. Uh, next, we have Simon Welsh, who's the National Coordinator for Financial Investigation um, at the National Police Keys Chiefs Council and also works here in the City of London, um, which is the leading um, police force in the UK for financial crime. Uh, Simon leads on anti-money laundering policy coordination across the country uh, in his role at the um, National Police Chiefs Council. Um, and thirdly, Jane G who's a volunteer lead at the Financial Crime Working Group at the Payments Association. Uh, Jane has also kindly contributed to her, uh, her valuable input on anti-money laundering and beneficial ownership during the production of, of our report, uh, and for which we're very grateful. And then find, last and by no means least, uh, Steve Smith, who you've just heard from and who is the partner, as I say, for financial services disputes uh, at uh, Evershed Sutherland. Um, Steve specializes in corporate crime and investigations um, and is an experienced litigator, so he's been is perfectly placed to, um, to, to do this work. So if our panelists could all please um, put their cameras on, we'll, uh, we'll begin the discussion. And, um, and first, I'm, I'm going to turn to you, Nick, if, if I may. Um, you've contributed significantly to policy development on financial crime and anti-money laundering um, at academic research at Cardiff University, but also in your advisory roles internationally, uh, not least in the United Nations, to name but one. But based on your experience and contributions, could you share your views on what makes an effective anti-money laundering framework what is the role of international cooperation in the path towards this and how an effective and transparent beneficial ownership regime might underpin it? Yeah, um, good morning, everybody, and thank you for inviting me to be part of the panel today. And, and Anthony, thank you for the for the questions. I'll, I'll do my best to answer those in four minutes. I think that may be uh, another article of sort of 15, 20,000 words maybe in terms of a complete answer. I think to take your first point regarding an effective anti-money laundering framework, I think that and I was thinking about this last night and, and a little bit this morning. I think that there are some common issues that I think make an effective framework. I think firstly, it's about political will. I think that's that's very important. Um, secondly, it's about a good legal framework. Um, and then obviously linked into that is enforcement. Um, I think what's becoming predominantly more important now across the world are the is the importance of the private public partnership, as we've seen in the UK in terms of Jim Lath being seen as an exemplar. And then it's about um, resources in terms of law enforcement to be able to undertake the job effectively. And then it's about exchange of information. So I think if you combine all of those um, six points together, um, that probably makes an, an effective um, AML framework. How you define effective, of course, is another matter altogether. Um, and there are there's a lot of debate within academic circles. I think if if we sort of drill down a little bit more regarding the um, the beneficial ownership regime, I think it's really important to look at what the UK has done within the past sort of eighteen months to two years. You've got the Economic Crime Transparency and uh, Enforcement Act of twenty twenty two, but just to point out again that links back to political will. And if we look at the background behind the law, I mean it was first proposed as part of the economics or the anti-corruption plan in 2014. So it's a long time in terms of coming into fruition. And a lot of commentators have suggested that if it wasn't for the Russian invasion of Ukraine, that law might not have been expedited um, a little bit. So there's obviously that, that particular issue there. 
And of course, more recently, we then got the Economic Crime and Corporate Transparency Act of 2023, where the suggestion are about closing loopholes within the, the UK's legal framework. But of course, as an academic, um, I, I can sit back on the fence and look at a variety of publications and sort of issues into this. And again, you just look at the Transparency International report of February last year, um, where they claim that there are still 52,000 properties in the UK that are still owned anonymously. So having an effective email, email regime is, 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 is essential to tackling illicit financial flow and money laundering and tackling organized criminal gangs and, and terrorism finances and fraudsters. But ultimately it is about, you know, closing those loopholes with an effective enforcement regime. Um, and of course it's against the background of, of the mutual evaluation report in 2018, where you know, FATA praised the UK um, AML CTF regime as being the best in the world. So these legal developments are particularly important, but ultimately there are still going to be loopholes that sadly uh, money launderers forces are actually going to um, to exploit. So hopefully that answers the first question for you, Anthony. It, it certainly does, and apologies, I'm just having a, a few difficulties with my, my microphone. Thanks very, very much indeed, Nick. Um, Simon, I'm going to come over to you next. And, um, and so through your work at uh, the National Police Chiefs Council, um, you've been very closely involved with the compliance and enforcement side of anti-money laundering and beneficial ownership regimes. Um, can you share what lessons you've learned on how regulators, policymakers, and indeed us in industry can work with enforcement to try and make it more holistic? And, and effective. Uh, and what are your thoughts on the current state of play on um, AML and beneficial ownership um, issues in, in, in the, here in the UK? Uh, well, thank you, Anthony, and uh, thanks for the invitation to join the panel this morning. Um, yeah, you know, you're right. This this is a welcome change. This legislation for us. Um, it's been a long time coming, I think. Um, uh, one of the main things for us is actually understanding who, who beneficial owners are. At the start of any investigation, you need to understand who's behind um, these things. And, and, and at the moment, it's it's just been a register for a, for a length of time. Anybody could uh, could sign up to it. There was no there was no checks and balances and verification around who was actually signing on. And effectively, we were allowing people getaway cars, uh, as if you could call them that, uh, companies that they were using to, to 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 move their money around. So in old style, a simple analogy is we were just giving them access to vehicles to move money all around the world. Uh, and that's something that we're obviously trying to stop. So what can, what can the industry do around this? <clears throat> well, recording accurate details, doing your KYC properly, your CDD, actually understanding who that beneficial owner is and making sure you grow with that company. You understand the business. It's absolutely critical to, to actually understanding what they're about. Very often you'll see a turnover from a company go from very, very small amounts to massively large amounts. Is that because they're being massively effective in what they're doing commercially, or is that because they've been compromised and they're being used as a conduit for organised crime? And to actually understand that is absolutely key. Uh, and I can't say that that must go on to the, the, the duration of a relationship with customers. You must actually understand where they're going. And it helps you commercially as well to actually understand what they're doing, offer them better products, et cetera, et cetera. But I mean, one of the main things for us is also understanding your own products. If you're seeing an overwhelming use in a product or something like that, is it because it's a good product or is it because there's an inherent weakness with that product that someone else has actually worked out how they can actually use that to actually further organize criminality and launder illicit, illicit funds? Um, Clearly for us, we need to make sure there are consequences for people who are abusing the system. And at the moment, that's quite weak. And for policing them, there are massive challenges for us. We can't do all this by ourselves. Uh, we're never going to arrest our way out of these situations. And clearly we need private sector to actually look and identify some of these things. You've got massive analytical capabilities that we haven't got a lot of the time. You understand your business and it's up to you to call out where you see bad practice or you see bad actors. You've got to call them out and, and, and actually help us. And that with the new act coming in to make the, the information exchange a lot, a, a lot easier, to use the current SARS reporting system more effectively, but also where you've identified something that clearly is an issue. For example, Chinese underground banking was probably identified first 
um, by the private sector and brought to our attention as a result of that. We've worked out a way to try and combat that. But clearly, there's a massive role within the within the financial sector and industry to help us to actually police this area, which is key to us. And, and hopefully, the company's house new powers will go some way into actually understanding who ultimate, ultimate beneficial owners are and making it easy for us for our investigations. And that's not just only to start an investigation with the series involved in it, but that's also in relation to asset recovery at the end of it as well. If we know where the assets are, we can go after them. If we don't know who those assets are, we will really struggle. And one of the main things about it is the consequences. And, you know, cr criminality is all about risk and reward. They are a business in themselves. If the risks are too high, they won't, they won't go in for this. Um, they're looking for the rewards. And at the moment, there are rewards for doing what they do. And what we're trying to do is to raise the risks there, make it a more hostile environment. And by doing that, we need, obviously, the, the, the cooperation and the skills, skill sets from the private sector. Thanks, Simon. That's that's um, that's really that's really interesting. It's really helpful to get that perspective from um, from the official sector um, and, and, and from law enforcement, particularly. Um, Jane, um, I'm going to come to you, having heard from the from the enforcement side of things. And maybe we could explore a little bit about public private cooperation um, in, in the context that you've seen it for, as your on your work as a volunteer lead for financial crime at uh, the Payments Association. And in and in particular, what has been your observations about approaches to public-private partnerships to tackle financial crime, and specifically when looking at beneficial ownership? And from your perspective, what has worked quite well and what could we do better going forwards um, based on, on your experience of uh, international models? And, and indeed, if you could comment too on, on, on the consistency of those, that, that, that would be useful as well, I think. Thank you very much, Anthony, and thank you um, very much for inviting me to this panel. I think the report um, is going to make a difference, and I think the recommendations are very valuable. Um, I have two roles. Um, I, my main job is within two reg tech companies. Um, that's Numitor Limited and Risk Alert 247 Limited. Um, Numitor is the parent company. Um, so I also have a role leading a working group on financial crime within the Payments Association. And that working group has about 30 members from across the industry, both fintechs, banks and reg tech companies. Um, and let me just say quickly something on reg techs, because reg techs are terribly important in this environment. Um, reg techs are needed because banks are not technology companies and what Simon has said about data analytics is really important. The criminals use their use data, use loopholes, we need to use data um, and we'll talk um, it come on to talk about that in more detail. Um, but I work with Graham Barrow which is um, a great privilege because Graham is analysing companies house data on a daily basis. He is identifying patterns and networks within companies house data and showing that um, there is a very sophisticated use of or abuse of companies house. Um, he has a particularly good analytical mind and a particular ability um, because the, the data and the analytics which uh, the software is enabling is crucial. Um, and I would like to say to Simon that we do work with law enforcement and we are trying really hard as a company to make some of the capability available to stop some of the practices. Um, I will come on to PP partnerships, Anthony, but I'd also like to say great that we've got the new act. It's wonderful that it's it's there after a year of debate about it. But we need that secondary legislation now. Um, so most of it will not be in force yet. Um, and criminals are continuing to abuse companies' house every single day. We do have, I mean, this government, um, governments generally are very worried about economic crime. It damages the economy. It stunts growth in the economy. Um, and that's a crucial factor. So obviously, as Simon has said, the public sector can't do everything. It has to have the help of the private sector. Um, that is crucial. And the economic crime plan makes great play of the importance of public private partnerships. Um, it's a crucial part of the UK's response to um, financial crime. 
do remember that we talk about financial crime, but actually money laundering is the necessary result of almost all crime. Um, and I do uh, would like to just say that I have read Tristram Hook's, Hick's book on the war on dirty money, which makes that point really well. Um, people talk about financial crime all the time, but actually they need to look at criminality in general uh, and on a much more broader basis. So private partnership, private public partnerships are important. Um, and I've, I'd like to see much more done in terms of, you know, regulators are talking to trade bodies, UK Finance Payments Association, but they need to talk to them more. The regulators and law enforcement should sometimes put themselves in the shoes of commercial companies and look at just how difficult CDD and KYC is. Um, because there isn't a level playing field. Um, smaller companies are commercial. They've got limited budgets. And, you know, there needs to be. It's unfortunate. We want competition in the payments market, but there isn't a level playing field when it comes to access to the right data. And you can't assess risks unless you have access to the right data. So I would make a big plea for there to be much more dialogue between regulators, law enforcement and the private sector, and particularly the, the companies, the reg techs, which have the technology which could help both of them. I'll come on to a bit more later if you want me to, Andrew. Of course, I, ab absolutely. Thank you very much. <clears throat> that's that's really interesting. Can you can you hold up your the book again? Because I think people would uh, we didn't get to see it. So, yeah, I think it sounds like that's a good recommendation. And, it's and it's called it's called the War on Dirty Money. Um, it's by Tristram Hicks and Nicholas Gilmore. Um, Tristram Hicks um, was a former. A new Scotland Yard detective superintendent, and he's become an international criminal justice advisor. Um, so he's very knowledgeable about the topic and also doesn't just have a UK perspective, because that's what is important about this report. Taking that global pers perspective is, is very important. I mean, it, it's a really interesting point, the interplay between financial crime and non-financial crime, I guess, and how the proceeds of the latter inevitably lead lead to the former. I mean, do you think on do you think there's too much emphasis of trying to tackle real crime by by targeting through the financial system? I mean, in in a sense, is it do you think is it an appropriate strategy to try or and any or is government trying and if so is it an appropriate strategy to try and and tackle the problem of wider crime through the financial system or or should it be the other way around you kind of tackle real crime and then you won't end up with any financial crime um i i think that unless we all want to pay double the taxes or perhaps treble the taxes we're paying, that it's terribly important that the financial sector plays a part because we can't expect the public sector to do everything. Um, and I, I, I think that recognition is there. However, um, there are there is the whole company's house reform basis. If the public sector doesn't get certain things right and they haven't had company's house right yet, we're, st we're still waiting for that sec crucial secondary legislation. So the public sector has a has a very important um, infrastructure role to play because criminals are, I, I, I hesitate to say that they're more sophisticated, but they are canny and they will find any loopholes that exist. So unless the financial sector plays um, an important part, we'll all have to pay a lot more money for law enforcement. However, I do think that there is more cooperation that could happen between the regulators, law enforcement and the financial services sector. And I think that people who are uh, financial investigators could quite easily move between the two. Um, and there could be a system where um, the public sector takes advantage of some of the skills and knowledge which the private sector have built up. Um, that, that I'm sure Simon would agree that that would be welcomed. That's interesting. That's fascinating. Thank you very much for that. Um, 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 I'm going to turn back to Steve now. Um, uh, you know, when, and um, you know, we you talked about the 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 recommendations that the report covers. Um, 
what are the what are some of the key findings from the report from a legal perspective and what are your recommendations to policymakers to uh, achieve a legal regulatory framework that's fit for purpose today um both in the uk and globally and i think you know also um any reflections on 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 jane's points on the public and private partnership would be would be interesting to hear in that context as well so i think it's a really interesting question. As a lawyer, I'll probably become very unpopular with many lawyers because I think part of the legal challenge is the more complexity that you build into a system, the more scope there is for interpretation, which creates shadows and shadows that people wishing to hide can hide in. And so I think that the, the more simple you can keep uh, the legal requirements around a system, the more effective it will be and the easier it will be to have that consistency globally and by simple i mean being clear and precise around the basic information that is required around ownership and control shareholders and directors being very clear what those definitions mean so as to avoid wriggle room within those having those simple definitions being harmonized as much as possible and consistent across different entities where that is possible having simple and controlled access to data one of the the big challenges that we've seen over the last few years is this challenge between data privacy and the need for the public interest in fighting financial crime and actually the courts in europe have found that data privacy has overridden uh, the general uh, interest of fighting financial crime by saying that actually general access to public uh, to public registers it is too much and where the courts are with that is where they are but i don't think that that should necessarily hinder still having regimes where access is available but in a controlled way so you have a, a simple system with simple information within it with clear guidelines around gateways to obtain that information to satisfy and to balance those conflicting interests it is possible to balance those in my view but I also think that the th third part, which is where the UK is starting to move to, but as Jane says, let's do it more quickly, please, is actually let's put obligations and burdens on the people who are running the registers to make sure that they are run effectively, that they are maintained, and that enforcement provisions are used to give bite to people and to show the, the need to be providing uh, reliable information to those to the registers and from a public private perspective you know we've seen that work so well across the industry you know the joint my laundry sorry the gym the joint um my laundry intelligence task force for example where banks have worked with the nca very effectively in sharing information demonstrate that for me public private partnerships are the future and they really can work but i think before we can get to that part we do need to have very clear rules of engagement around what the registers are doing and make sure the information itself is good and reliable. So probably haven't answered your question from a legal perspective and probably made myself unpopular with other lawyers, but I do think simple is best. No, I think that that's um, that that's really that that that's a really key point because if something isn't practical and isn't easily understood, and then then it's difficult for, for it to work. So we're going to go to. Um, uh, we're we're going to go to to some to some uh, audience questions now, um, uh, and um, and so I think um, what we'll do is if you can please you'll find a Q and A in the bottom of your screen and. Um, and uh, you, from there, you'll, you'll be able to sort of put in questions. You can either do it anonymously or, or, or not. And we'll try and get through as many of them as we can. But the, the first one's from um, Barry Andrews, um, who has pointed out that investigative journalism plays a big role in this in this whole um, issue, um, such as in the context of the Panama or Pandora Papers. Um, but the European Court of Justice recently took a decision to restrict general access to UBO registers in the EU. And Barry asks, uh, what's the situation in the UK um, and any other observations any of the panellists want to make on access to UBOs? So I don't know who would like to, to, to take that one. I'm, I'm, gonna... I'm, I'm happy to take uh, to say something about that because okay. the Economic Crime and Corporate Transparency Act 
um, puts lots of obligations on the registrar in the UK. There are four, I think there are four principles that the registrar's got to, to, um, to abide by. And a lot of those are to do with um, making sure the information is accurate and reliable that's on the register and also to prevent any information getting onto the register which will mislead members of the public. So there, there is going to be quite a different regime coming up um, where there will the registrar will have significant obligations um, and there will be a whole regime of identifying um, and verifying the identity of directors and those who are putting information onto the register. So we're, we're going to have um, a, a much more robust regime in the UK. But as I said, we're waiting for the legislation, the secondary legislation to put that in place. Um, but I'm sure that Nick will have a view on this as well. Oh, I've been set up quite nicely there, haven't I? <laughs> um, it, I think we, I just got to go back and reflect a little bit. So I'm just going to take you back to that mutual evaluation report. I mean, Jane, you know what's coming from me about this. If you look at the, the ratings provided by Financial Action Task Force for the UK, in terms of exchange of information, the UK is regarded as the best in the world. Now, I've been involved in a project within that for the last two or two and a half years, and the key findings will be published in February of next year in the Journal of Business Law. And what we found is that there are a number of instances in terms of financial crime prevention where the exchange of information, not between the private sector and the public sector, but between the public sector and the public sector. So we, we found three acts of terrorism where HMRC didn't inform the relevant agencies regarding suspicions of tax fraud linked into terrorists, for example. So it's against that backdrop that I'm, I'm a little bit concerned about the decision from the European, again, I'm not a European uh, lawyer far from it, but it's about proportionality. So from my perspective, exchange of information, I think, as, as, as Steve alluded to earlier, it is essential to tackle financial crime. Um, so, and, and I agree with, with the other speakers that Jimmet has been a, a, you know, a very good example of what the UK can do. Is it perfect? No. Would I like to see more information exchanged? Absolutely. Data sharing is essential. But how we can do that in, in, um, in, a, in a financial era where you know, law enforcement have got their hands tied by reduced budgets, it, it's very difficult for everyone to be involved, the private and public sector, to, to, to actually improve that. So I think from, from my perspective, um, the exchange of information and data sharing is essential. And the... But of course, it has to be proportionate. I think that's the most important thing I can possibly uh, be non-committal on. Thank, thanks very much, Nick. And and, and staying with you, we've got a, another question that that's come in, and which is, you know, how do you believe that the expansion of LEIs, who are legal entity identify, uh, identifiers, beyond financial services into other sectors, could ameliorate AML controls? And should this be a consideration for companies' has reforms following the passing of the um, Economic Crime and Corporate Transparency Act? Yeah, I think as Jane alluded to earlier, that the, the financial services sector does act as a financial policeman, and I appreciate that that's a difficult job for the sector to do. So I think that by broadening the, the scope of entities that will be bound by the relevant laws and regulations, I think that's to be welcomed. But again, it's about proportionality. The, the sector pays a significant financial cost in terms of AML compliance, customer due diligence, the sanctions regime, and, and as obviously we've seen with you know, the NatWest conviction in 2021, the SRA beginning to use more enforcement powers, it, it's obviously going to have that fear factor within within the set. So I think that that's to be broadly welcomed because you might get more data, more information, more accurate information from a variety of sources. So um, that to me would be a key part of the reforms in terms of companies' house. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I'm going to ask the audience to keep the questions coming. Um, but uh, one short one that's come in is, um, you know, which jurisdiction, in your views, has the best or the most transparent UBO regime? I mean, maybe, Simon, you, from your experience, you could you could go for that one first and then we'll hear from everyone quickly on on who has the best and most transparent one. <laughs> that's probably not the best question <clears throat> for, for me to answer that one. No. Um, <laughs> there's clearly ones that we that we know that aren't too uh, too easy to deal with um but in reality most mo most of Euro Europe and North America we tend to have decent relationships with there are obviously jurisdictions that we we find more difficult which <laughs> I think most people are probably well aware of those ones so I I think it's yeah we we can always do better 
uh, quite clearly. Um, but uh, yeah, I think I'll I think I'll leave it at that. Politically, is probably the, the the best way to stay with that at the moment. Okay, well, fair enough. Well, maybe maybe we'll stick with you then, because actually, uh, relatedly, someone's asked about the scope for um, for the UK and EU to cooperate together um, post Brexit on anti money laundering, and and what's your your um, experience of that to date, and and how do you think that could could, could be improved if necessary? <clears throat> well, we we are working on obviously. You know, we had joint investigation teams at Europol and things like that that were working really well. So we're working to bridge the gap between what, what was before and what is now. Uh, I think the levels of cooperation, are, you know, are, are improving. Um, we, we are working on a number of cases uh, jointly with uh, with Europe and, and, and America around a load of sort of fairly big cases at the moment. So the, the information flows are still going. I think we can do we can probably do better. And I think in, in reality, just just across the piece, Financial intelligence is something that we do need to work on very hard. And the new strategies this year that we're developing are looking to drive up that intelligence. And that is not only, as Nicholas said, it's, it's between agencies, but it's also with, <clears throat> with the private sector as well to identify the things that we need to be working on, but also within policing to understand that, as Jane says, that all, you know, all, all crime is, is basically about money. Um, and, and to understand that, it's you, you need to know the money laundering structures that, that surround OCGs um, all the time that we work against them. You know, we, we, we tend to get fixated on sort of crimes like drugs and guns and things like that. But the reality is running between, between, behind all of this is, the, is a money laundering structure. So I think we're working really hard um, to try and drive up that intelligence. And that includes we've got people, you know, ILOs all around, all around the world. So we get better relationships with them as well so where we see something happening so we're building up a lot more contact now with the western balkans and things like that so we're working on you know developing those intelligence links so there's a, a lot of work going on at the moment this year especially to drive up intelligence around financial intelligence and that will obviously include better relationships internationally but also as i said within agencies and with the private sector thank you that's um that's really interesting and uh, very briefly um uh, Steve, you know, from a legal point of view, um, what could be a way to prevent privacy concerns and issues regarding um, PPPs? I mean, could you, could, you know, could there be, for instance, um, common definitions of PPPs and similar thresholds in UBOs between the UK uh, and uh, and the EU? And relatedly, in the Netherlands, um, second transaction monitoring Netherlands, uh, which is a partnership between private and public actors to share data, has been suspended at parliament level because of concerns regarding privacy and data protection. So if you or anyone's got any comments on that, then um, one of the audience members would be keen to hear from them. Um, I'm not a data privacy lawyer, so I will cobble together uh, my understanding from having spoken with other, other data privacy lawyers, but it's always about showing necessity and proportionality and, and the fairness principle and, and delivering those. And I think that that can be achieved. Again, and I'll go back to um, where I was before, the more simple approach you can take and the more justified you can for the sharing of information and setting out the scenarios where you can access information and the extent and depth of information to be established will help put those protections in place. And we certainly see in the AML regime anyway that the Proceeds of Crime Act has been amended recently, for example, to allow financial institutions to share customer data with each other where they have suspicions around financial crime and money laundering. I think similar provisions can be built into local legislation to enable that. So that's my very short answer to a very long question. Anthony, you're on mute. Thank you. Sorry, time is creeping up on us. Um, um, so thanks for the, for the short answer. Jenny, um, we've got five minutes left. So but briefly, could I just turn to you before doing one final question on uh, which I'll round up on in a minute. But, you know, on data sharing, you know, we've, we've just seen that raised in the context of the Netherlands. And what sort of um, what, what are the challenges that you think we need to overcome in order to um, enable more data sharing, which is obviously key to international cooperation here? Um, thank you, Anthony. Uh, I I think the Data Protection and Digital Information Bill, which is currently under discussion um, in Parliament, could be quite transformative, um, particularly if uh, financial institutions are obliged to share data. 
Um, there are, I should say, a number of trials going on at the moment that I'm aware of um, where data sharing has become crucial. I spoke to somebody yesterday evening who said that they have got an 80 percent success rate at identifying criminal activity through their data sharing. I mean, um, it could be completely transformative. And I appreciate I'm not a data protection lawyer either, Steve. Um, I had to smile a bit at your comments because my old tutor, Roy Good, who used to be at commercial law, uh, do commercial law at Queen's, uh, used to say um, that it's the function of the lawyer is to inject doubt where none existed before. Uh, I'm <laughs> afraid that far too many lawyers do actually adopt that philosophy. But I agree with you. We do want it to be simple. But please don't go away with the idea that, you know, actually the data is complex and the analysis of the data is complex. Um, and so it, it would be, it's good to have simple, clear rules, but we need to share more if we're going to be successful, basically. And I'm hoping that there will be um, data sharing mandated soon. Uh, Anthony, Perfect, thank, thank you. you very much. Um, just, oh, go on, Nick. So I just wanted to say that, you know, that the legal framework already exists, as Steve and Jane have alluded to, but part of the important thing is that sometimes the obligation to exchange information between the public sector, so law enforcement to government departments or to security services, is optional. It isn't compulsory. So for a simple legal amendment in terms of tax fraud, that could solve a whole raft of possible problems. So sorry to interrupt you there. That's a useful, useful point to make. Well, look, maybe, maybe on that, I can just ask a, a final quick fire round then, if everyone's got 20 seconds. Um, what is the um you know we if we could achieve one thing to make progress on the regulatory and standards framework for beneficial ownership in the next year or two what would you say it should be and i'm going to go to you first um steve um i think i would be seeking more harmony across so less registers and more harmony uh across the approach simon uh, to look at the back catalog and try and get rid of the companies that we know are sham companies and the ones that are already there that we can probably actually look to, to weed out so that we, we're dealing with less of a problem. So that's a, that's a massive task, but uh, I do think it's one that we need to get, uh, get started with. And Jane? Open access to all company registers, um, particularly for reg tech companies who are much better at data analytics than banks on their own. Um, that, that would be my um, wish. Um, and thank you. And finally, uh, finally, Nick. Uh, can I say all of the above? <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm going to let you get away with that because you you. you just made your point around um, around the law around data sharing as well. So, well, look, we're thank you to everyone. We're we've we've come to the end of our our time, unfortunately. Um, and so I'm I'm going to finish up. Um, um, thank you very much uh, for your contributions. Um, thank you also, in particular, to Evershed Sutherland and, and Steve for your uh, for your help. Thank you to all our great panelists and to everyone who's joined the webinar today. And um, and and um, finally, just to say that the link to our report will soon be available on our website, and um, you'll be able to see it there and, and read it. So thank you everyone for joining. And um, please do get in touch um, with um, with the City of London Corporation, who will be able to direct any further questions and things that you have, because we're we're keen to encourage more conversation and discussion in in this area. The publication of our report is just, after all, the beginning of our process of a process, not the end. Thank you very much, everyone. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you.